Welcome back to this second lecture in this lecture series on CCNA4 with me, Joachim Schauderstad from the University of Hovde. And now that we have, uh, had, have had an overview of different uh, wide area network related terminology and concepts, what we're going to do is dig into some of the uh, some of the different protocols and concepts that Cisco decided for us to dig into during this course and what we will start to is point-to-point -point links. Uh, so what we will do is talk a little bit about serial communication because those point-to-point -point links will mainly use serial communication and we will di uh, dig deeper into uh, PPP, the point-to-point -point protocol, and look at the operation, implementation, and troubleshooting for those. And we'll also do uh, through two practicals throughout this lesson. Uh, I just got to hope that it doesn't take all too long time. Uh, so if we start with some serial point-to-point -point connection, you should know that point-to-point -point connections are sometimes also referred to as, uh, as yes, serial connections or least lines. And communications over a serial connection is a method where bytes are transmitted one by one over a single channel. Uh, you should also know that a point-to-point -point interface will not have a MAC address because point-to-point -point communication by default is the communication between uh, two different points. It's not a multi-axis media, so there, therefore there is no need for the MAC addresses. So, uh, looking at the point-to-point -point connections, point-to-point uh, -point links provide a permanent dedicated connection, which is, uh, of course, a good thing because you will have reduced latency and jitter. You will know that your connection is always there, but you should know that it is quite expensive, and since we're using serial communications, it is actually rather slow. Uh, I've just decided to uh, input a listing of different bit rates or bandwidths for serial communication, and as you can see, we talked about T1 and T3 in the last lesson, uh, and as for T3, you have a bandwidth of uh, 44 megabits per second, which isn't really that much uh, if you talk uh, if you consider what uh, what you have uh, or what rates you have in fiber optic cables and stuff like that. Uh, so if we go and look just at different wide area network encapsulation protocols, uh, you should know that when we prepare something for the wide area network, we encapsulate it using some technology that is designed for the wide area network. And why do we have to consider this? Well, when we are talking about the wide area network as opposed to the local area network, we usually have longer distances and we need cost efficiency because we are paying for what we're doing uh, since we're using someone else's network. So when we're talking least lines, we will we are talking about protocols like HDLC and PPP that we will discuss in this course, or SLIP, which is beyond the scope of this course. Uh, those also work within circuit switched uh, network, where you have a circuit switched connection to uh, through a telephone company. Uh, as you remember, circuit switch means that you do not have a dedicated line. Instead, you have a session set up whenever you start communication, and you'll have that. Uh, and you'll have that uh, connection for the duration of that session. There are also packet switched uh, technologies like X25, frame relay and ATM. Uh, those are all beyond, beyond the scope of this course, but packet switch is, is essentially where you decide on one route for each packet uh, and that resembles an IP network to uh, uh, fully. So that is something that we're aware about. So for this lesson, we will of course discuss the point to point uh, as I said before, and we will start with HDLC. So HDLC is the default encapsulation on any serial interface with a Cisco, uh, with a Cisco device. Uh, so how you would configure this is basically that you enter an interface using the interface command and then you go encapsulation HDLC. So this is the default on any synchronous serial interface, so uh, you would never do this configuration. And there are limitations of HDLC, or uh, I wouldn't say limitations, but there are other things you can do with PPP that we'll discuss in a little while, making for the case where you would rather use PPP than HDLC. But if you're just doing the action of setting together two Cisco routes, using a serial cable, then you are in effect using HDLC encapsulation. Uh, so then, what is PPP? Uh, it's a protocol used for uh, used to transport layer 3 traffic over serial links. It's designed for IPv4, but can in es essentially transport any layer 3 protocol. So uh, PPP is a layer 2 protocol uh, and not a layer 3 protocol, but it can transport any layer 3 protocol. Uh, so uh, what is good with it uh, is that it, is, it does, in contrast to HDLC, support monitoring of link quality, it supports link authentication, and it's non-proprietary. 
so what we want, what we can do here is to have a link that is set up and we can have PPP automatically monitor the quality of that link and we can also have uh, authentication. So if we are an ISP and we, we and a customer calls us and wants to, uh, wants to buy a lease line, then we can set up authentication so that that client can only access if it's allowed to. Um, uh, PPP in itself uh, contains three main components. So first it has HDLC-like framing for transporting multiple protocol packets over point-to-point -point links. Um, very nice sounding words, but what it does is that it has a framing so it encapsulates whatever data you want to send in a, in a way that the other side can understand. Nothing weird about that. Uh, but it also has the link control protocol or the LCP that is used to establish, configure and test the data link connection. And then it has a family of different network control protocols. And that is for establishing and configuring different network layer protocol. So PPP actually allows for simultaneous use of different network layer protocols. The most common MPCs are, of course, the one for IPv4 and the one for IPv6, but it also uh, can also handle Apple Talk and a bunch of others. So if we look at this uh, in a little in relation to the ISO, uh, ISO model, uh, the PPP works mainly on the data link layer, but also with those MPCs a little bit up on the network layer. So uh, on uh, layer two, on the data link layer, we have the uh, authentication and the other options that are handled by the LCPs. And going up to the network layer, we have those network control protocols. So if we di dig a little bit deeper into the LCPs and N NCPs, the LPCs, what they do is that they provide automatic configuration of the interfaces at, at each end. Uh, so for instance, they can handle ver varying limits on package sizes. They can detect common misconfiguration errors. They can terminate the link. So for instance, if uh, you can set a threshold on how what quality the link has to have and LCP can automatically terminate the link if, it goes, if it's too weak. Uh, and it can also determine then when a link is functioning properly or when it's failing. So PPP permits multiple network layer protocols, as I said before, uh, and for every network layer protocol uh, used, PPP uses a separate MPC. And the N or NCP and the NCPs include functional fields containing standardized codes to indicate what network layer protocol that the PPP will encapsulate. Uh, so let's look about the operations of PPP just a little bit. So the first thing that will happen when you set up a PPP link is that there will be a session establishment phase. Uh, it, it will actually be handled in three different phases, beginning with link establishment, uh, which is basically uh, about shall we negotiate. Uh, then we have the second phase where we determine the link quality. Uh, basically, we dis decide whether or not to monitor link quality and what different uh, what different uh, aspects that should work for that. And then we have this third and final phase, uh, which is the network protocol negotiation. And then we will just hand over to, uh, to the network control protocol to, to decide on those parameters. So looking a little bit more uh, on the LCP operation, it begins, uh, we can we can separate it into three different roles. So we have link establishment, maintenance and termination. So in the establishment phase, the LCP opens the link and negotiates configuration parameters. Then it will hand over to MPC for the MPC configuration. And this establishment is something that must complete before the link can be used. Then during the session, the, we have a link maintenance phase where the LCP tests the link and it does this using echo request and echo reply frames. And then finally, uh, LCP is also responsible for link termination. And this can only happen once the MPC has terminated the MP MPC part of the link and then LPC will terminate the link as at the LPC layer. So let's look at a little bit um, uh, about on the different configuration options that we have for PPP. So first we can have authentication using PAP or SHAP. We will look at those uh, on the next slide. And you should also know that PPP support, supports compression. And when we're talking about serial communication that can be quite expensive, compression can be a way to actually get more, uh, more bang for whatever you spend uh, in that you can get more bandwidth than you're actually paying for if you compress the data you're sending. So uh, in order to send, uh, I don't know, 100 bytes of data, maybe you'll only need to actually transmit 80 bytes. Uh, 
And uh, we can also have multi-link PPP, that is, uh, if I remember correctly, beyond the scope of this course. So we'll not talk more about that. Instead, we'll just head into uh, the PPP authentication part. And uh, so PPP has two different ways of authent uh, authenticating. We can either have PAP or SHAP, where PAP is a two-way handshake and SHAP is a three-way handshake. So let's say that we have one remote router and one central si side router. Uh, and the remote router is to authenticate to the central site router. Using PAP, which is just a two-way handshake, the remote router will send its username and password, and the central site router will either accept or reject that. Uh, using SHAP, which is challenge-based, uh, the central router will actually challenge the remote, uh, remote router, and then the remote router will respond with a username and a hashed password and then the central site router will either accept or reject this. What is nice with CHAP is that this challenge is something that is continuous throughout the session, so the, so the authentication doesn't hold forever, which it, it does with PAP. It, uh, with PAP, the handshake holds until the session is terminated. Also, another drawback of PAP is that the password is sent in, in clear text, so whenever you can for security reasons, CHAP is, of course, your better alternative. Uh, we will look uh, into how we can configure both PAP and SHAP in just a few minutes. But for now, let's go into uh, look a little bit on uh, PPP configuration. So this is actually not the slide that I intended. We should do a demonstration. So the demonstration that we will do first now is the one that is called 2326. And we'll head over to Packet Tracer and just get ahead and do that. And just, uh, just as a coincidence, I have that very, uh, that very packet tracer task up and running. So what we're gonna do here is basically configure uh, PPP on all the serial links here. You can see the the links that look like uh, red reddish. Uh, lightning bolts or something, those are serial links, and we will we'll, uh, we will go ahead and uh, and make those use PPPS encapsulation. So we'll just dig right into it, starting with router one, and, and get into our little CLI. Enable configure terminal. We should know this by now, so I'm trying to speed it up. To enter a serial interface, uh, I of course just do interface serial s and the name, oh, and the name, which is zero zero zero. And then when I'm in, what I basically have to do, as you can see here on the right hand side, is typing in encapsulation and PPP, and I will have changed the encapsulation type. Now you, now you can see that something actually goes down here, and that is because the encapsulation on the other side is HDLC, and when we have uh, unmatching encapsulation, of course the link won't work. So let's continue and configure the rest of the interfaces here. Uh, going to right router two, enable configuration terminal interface serial zero zero one and encapsulation PPP hitting out uh, hitting out caps lock. Going to router three, enable. There were quite a lot of uh, interfaces to do here, so let's just go. Go ahead and get started. Interface serial zero zero zero, and cap PPP, and then we do zero zero one, and then finally, and as you can see here, the links change to up again when I have the same configuration on both both ends. What you notice here is that when I get this little input here coming all the time, it screws up what I'm doing. So there is a way that you can fix this. I'm just going to show you real quickly. If you don't want the output from the logging mechanism to screw up your commands, you can go into config, you can go line console zero, and then there is a nice command that is called logging synchronous. So now that is not going to happen anymore. Uh, so again, we will continue with the last interface. So it's interface serial zero one zero and encapsulation PPP. And now you can see that I'm that the logging message comes and I'm giving it, given a new prompt, which is very nice. So the final part is that I'm going to 
do the same on the internet cloud here. So I have to click the internet cloud and then I come into some other nice weird view and I have to click the ISP. Uh, so I'm in the ISP router and I will do enable configuration terminal. I'll see what interface I needed here. It doesn't say, okay, there it says in the instructions. So it's interface serial zero zero zero, and there we should have encapsulation PPP. So that is all you have to do to enable PPP as encapsulation protocol on all of the serial, serial links. What we're going to do now is to go back. So we have everything here. We're going to fast forward time a little bit because we have EIDRP in this domain and we need it to propagate and make sure that we can ping everything. So I'm just sending a small little package here between the laptop and the PC and it works. Uh, and then we're going on to the PPP authentication. Okay, sorry I had, had to cut, cut your way a little bit because I got a phone call. Uh, however, now that we've done the, now that we configured all the serial interfaces to use PPP encapsulation, what we're actually going to do is to configure R2 and R3 so that there is PAP authentication in between those two. So remember with PAP authentication, what we have to do is configure uh, a two-way handshake so that each router will send a username and a password to the other side and thus be authenticated. And this actually relies on the built-in user database in the router. So what we have to do is to add each, uh, add a user for each router. And then for instance, if we want R2 to authenticate with R3, we will add a username and password for R2 and R3. And after that, we will make sure that R2 will send that uh, configuration to R3. So what we'll do is that we begin with R3 and what we're going to do first is add this username and password for R2. So basically we use the command uh, username R2 password Cisco. Uh, in reality you should prefer to use secret over password so that you can have the password stored uh, encrypted instead of in plain, in, pl in plain text but for this case it's just a demo so I'll go with password. Uh, now that, that is done, what you actually have to do is go into the serial interface and uh, enable the authentication. So what we will do is go into interface serial, in this case 001, and then what we will do is use the command PPP authentic authentication and PAP. So now we, uh, now we enabled PAP on this link and you can see that the link goes down because we only have authentication semi-configured on one of the links. We have to configure it on both links. Uh, but what we will do now is to input the information that R3 is going to send away to R2 uh, when we configured R2. So what we're going to do is PPP PAP and then we'll use send username which will be R3 and password which will be Cisco all the way around. So we're inputting this stuff still doesn't work because we have to do the R2 side. And what we will do on R2 is first uh, add a user for R3. So we'll start with going username R3 password Cisco. And that's done. Now we just have to take care of this link as well. So in this case, we go interface serial 001. And we again uh, enable authentication, PPP, alpha, authentication, PAP, and then PPP, PAP, send username. And in this case, what we will send is R2 and the password will be Cisco. And now we should see that the links should uh, hopefully come up again and they do right there. So now we have a P PPP link here that is authenticated using PAP. So the next thing that we've, we are going to do is to configure uh, SHAP authentication. And we will configure SHAP authentication between the ISP router and router 3. So the first thing that we have to do is uh, to go into the internet cloud again and hit the ISP router. So now that we are here, what we will do is again go into uh, the router and we will hit configuration terminal. When we are working with SHAP, the host name is important. So what is going to happen here is that instead of having usernames that we choose, the usernames will actually be the host names. 
Uh, <laughs> so I know that that sounds a little bit weird, but it's actually the way that it is. So before anything else can happen, what we have to do is set a hostname for this router. So we'll go with hostname ISP. And now we ha still have to configure a username for the router on the other ha side. So what we will do is that we will configure a username that we'll, we'll uh, call router3, which is the other side of this party. So we'll do username router3 and a secret that we want to use. So we do secret Cisco and uh, that is everything. So uh, next we just have to enable SHAP on the interface. So we'll go interface, serial, zero, zero, zero. And then we do PPP again, authentication. But in this case, we use SHAP over PAP. And you can see that the link goes down because we haven't yet configured the other side. So basically what happens now is that, uh, forget about, about the host name part, but what we configure is a user for the other side router. So the user here is R3 with a, with a secret Cisco. And that means that the, you, the host name on the other side has to be R3. And um, so going in to R3, we shall configure. We should, should configure the other side. What we have to do first is to add a user that corresponds with the other party host name, the ISP. So we'll type exit, and then we go username ISP, and we configure a secret for it. We'll go with Cisco still. And finally, interface serial. Which one was it? Zero one zero, and PPP authentication, SHAP. So, and you can see that it goes up again. So uh, actually SHAP is a little bit easier to configure because as long as we have the host names in place, the only thing that we need to do is configure username and passwords for the opposing sides. So if we have router three and the ISP, then the user that we create on router three should be named ISP and the user that we create on the ISP should be named R3 or router three. So now we've done everything and you can see that the links is up links are up here. The steps when you're configuring PPP is encapsulation PPP to decide that you want to use PPP encapsulation. Then if we want to do PAP, uh, we have to, as we saw here, looking in the running configuration, on the I mean, we first have to create a user and uh, user for the opposing side. And then we have to configure that we are going to use pap and we have to use the command PPP pap send username and uh, our own username and password that it should be stored as a username in the opposing router. When we do SHAP, what we need to do is to add a username for the opposing router, in this case, username ISP secret Cisco, and we then just have to enable SHAP. So that is it for this demonstration. I know there is something that I haven't done in this practical. I'll leave it to you to do that on your own. And I will see if we shouldn't go back to the lecture and just go through a very quick uh, troubleshooting slide. So something that I haven't mentioned in terms of troubleshooting is that there are at least three things that you should look on uh, look into when it comes to serial communication. So the first one is incorrect clock rate. One command that we hasn't talked about is the clock rate command where you decide on the clock rate, uh, namely how quickly the bits should be sent over the link. Those has to be the same over both sides of a serial link. Usually it's negotiated, but it doesn't always happen. So uh, a, a tip if, if the clock rate is wrong is to make sure that you just configure something like clock rate 64,000 on both sides of a serial link and it will work. Uh, the other one is inconsistent encapsulation. Maybe there is HDLC on one side and PPP on the other side, then it won't work. Uh, and the last and final thing that you should look into is PAP and SHAP misconfiguration, which is perhaps the most common way of breaking stuff. So uh, we shall do yet another demonstration before we end. So let's uh, let me just cut here and get back to you when I have the next packet tracer uh, assignment up and running. So we're up and running with Packet Tracer and this troubleshooting activity. Um, and basically, I'm going to do this pretty much unprepared. Uh, what we're going to do is to 
look at uh, different layers of uh, troubleshooting where we're going to troubleshoot PPP, IP configuration, and so on and so forth. I'm going to stick to the three routers and hope that I get everything right. Uh, actually, the first idea was that we should verify that cables are connected as specified. I think that I just did that and that they are, so let's just uh, let's just assume that, but what we're going to do is to look for inactive interfaces. Uh, the way that I would go ahead and do that is to just go into a, uh, a router and go to configuration terminal, and then I would go do show run and see if there are any interfaces that should be enabled that are instead shut down. So in this case, we can see that we have shut down on Ethernet 01, serial, yeah, they are all shut down. So that's the first thing that I'm going to fix. Make sure that all the interfaces on this device are enabled. So I'll just go interface, gigabit 01, no shut. And then we had interface serial 000, no shut. And then we had interface 001, no shut, and didn't work. So let's continue and see if it's the same issue on the other routers. So we'll go to router one. Um, and I'm going to show you uh, another command that you can use. So instead of just going to the uh, running configuration, what you could do is to go show IP interface brief do show IP interface brief, and you can see what they uh, see what they have. So uh, as a status, and as you see here, they are all down down. And if I go to the running configuration, I would assume that they are manually shut down, shut down, shut down, shut down. Yep. So we'll do the same story once again. Interface uh, gig zero one no shut. Very good troubleshooting exercise to have you enable a bunch of interfaces. I have to say that this brings a lot to uh, all of our uh, uh, networking skills. So let's just real quickly go up to router two and see if we have the same problem here. Uh, Cisco uh, enable class. Uh, configuration terminal, do show run, and we'll see if we have any interfaces that are shut down. So the serial interfaces are indeed shut down. So we'll go serial zero 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 with an interface in front of it. So we'll do no shut, and then we have zero zero one, also no shut, and enter. So now we're done with that part. Everything is uh, on and good at the physical layer. So now let's go repair the data link layer. So one of the things that you should look at here, as we said, is clock rates. So what we want to do is make sure that the clock rates are consistent. Uh, and the way you would do this is, again, with the do show run command. And we'll look into what clock rates that are set for our serial interfaces. So if we look here, uh, the clock rate for the serial 000 interface is 64,000. And if we look at router 1, 00, then it's interface 001. Interface 00, then interface 001. Now you can see that there are no clock rate configured. Um, let's just go there and configure it. Clock rate 64,000 so that we can be uh, completely sure that it's the same. It only applies to DCE interfaces, so we don't have to configure it there, so that link is fine. And then we can look at the other end here. And we will look at the 000 interface, uh, clock rate 64,000, and then we will look at 000 for router 2. So we have router 2, 000. 000 and then we have a whole nother clock rate. So we'll go in and fix that. And we'll have to go use interface before. 
in interface interface serial zero 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 now it's happy clock rate 64,000 only DC okay then I guess we have to adjust ourselves to the clock rate that is here 2 million so we'll do it on the router one end instead so what we'll do here is we will go uh, interface serial zero 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 and then we will go clock rate two one two three four five six and now it should be happy uh, I just want to tell you that this isn't something that you would normally do um, look into router two again and we'll look at the serial uh, interface that is called zero zero one clock rate 2 million and if we look at 001 or router 3 uh, we have nothing here so I'm just gonna go out on a limb and guess that it's not gonna be a default so what I'm going to do is go into uh, I'm going to go into what I'm what am I doing so I'm going to go into interface serial 001 and I'm going to do go no clock rate. Uh, so go do show run. And now uh, they should negotiate it for themselves. So we have a default here and I would just assume that it will be taken up again on router three so everything will work. Fine, it's a little bit hard something sometimes because Cisco does create uh, errors that doesn't really happen. Uh, next thing we should do is to make sure that we have PPP encapsulation for everything. And again, I think that the most simple way to go about and do this is to just look over all the serial interfaces and see if there is the encapsulation PPP statement missing somewhere. So if we begin with R router 3, we can see that for interface serial 000, there are, is no statement saying encapsulation PPP, meaning it is currently an HDLC interface. So how we fix that? Well, we go interface serial 000, and then we go encapsulation PPP, and it should be done. And then we rinse and repeat for the other routers. So router two, uh, looking at in interfaces. And again, we see that serial 000, there is no PPP encapsulation. <laughs> So we're already in the correct interface, and then we're gonna go encapsulation PPP. We do the same process on router two. And I am guessing that someone did a mistake on this router as well. If we look at the serial interfaces, yep, serial 001 does not have the PPP encapsulation. So interface serial 001. And we go encapsulation PPP. And now that should be done. So the next step in everything is to examine each link to verify that all routers are logging into each other correctly. And we should do this using SHAP. Uh, so remember from the last lesson that when we want SHAP, what we need to do at every interface to have is the PPP authentication SHAP symbol. And then we also need each router to have a username and password for each opposing router. So if we are R2, then we should have a username R1 and username R3. And let's see what password Cisco wants us to have. They want us to have the password Cisco. So we should have Cisco all the way around and we should have uh, PPP authentication SHAP all the way around and we should have all the users that we need. So let's start with fixing R2 where we actually have to fix both users. So what we're gonna do is just to go about and add them. So I'm going to go no username R3, no username R3, and then instead we'll just go username R3 secret Cisco, then we're going to do one for router one. So we have our users in place. And then as we remembered, we have to configure authentication for interface serial 001. And so we'll go about and do that. Interface serial 001, and we go PPP authentication SHAP. 
And then we go rinse and repeat on the other routers. So let's go to router three and see how badly they managed to um, not do this configuration correctly. I was gonna say something much less politically correct. So we're gonna go do show run. And let's look at a list of users names that we have. We have R1, it's correct. And we have uh, the authentication command missing on serial zero zero zero. So again, we're going to add router two then username r2 secret username secret Cisco and then we go into interface serial zero 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 and we go PPP authentication chap and that is actually all the troubleshooting that I'm gonna give you so I'm gonna leave the rest of this assignment up to you because I think that this is <laughs> cause for a very slow video demonstration uh, that is everything for this video demonstration on serial communication and PPP I hope it wasn't all too messy and that you learned something see you next time where we go uh, go talk at branch connections thank you and bye